morning, uh, we've, this is like a mini-series, it's a two-part series, so if you're used to watching uh, Netflix shows that have 10, 12 parts, well, we're doing a two-part series on faith, and that's kind of to, to inject us with faith, to fill us with fresh faith this morning and uh, into our world, and uh, I know that for all of us here today, you know, faith is something that is foundational to our lives, but also it's something that, that we need to be encouraged in continually uh, in our lives, and this is what the series is about this morning is really literally to stir up the gift of faith that's in us. Did you know that when you were born again, God said that He placed a measure of faith on the inside of every single believer. No one is without faith who has started a relationship with Jesus. And so what we want to do this morning, and I think we've heard so much already to encourage us in our faith, is really look at how we can put our trust in God to see miracles happen and to see mountains move. How many of you believe God can move mountains? God is a, he's a mountain moving God. You know, one of the favorite places that uh, we used to love to take our kids from the time, we've got three kids, but from the time they were super young, the favorite holiday place, particularly in winter, was to go out to a farm at Kingaroy. It was actually, still is there. It's um, Uncle Pete's and Auntie Pam's farm. They've got a beautiful farm. Uh, you can imagine one of those really just beautiful places, you know, and they've got the cattle and they've got all that sort of stuff. So we would take the kids out there every winter for a couple of days. And, you know, we grew up in the city. So when you go to the farm, right, the, the thing you want to do is the things you never get to do in the city, right? So the first thing would happen when we get out there was we'd just jump on the back of Uncle Pete's ute, like in the tray, and just stand up on the back and we'd drive around with Uncle Pete while we were helping with the jobs, you know, so we just stand up on the back. It's just nothing better. Stand on the back of the year, cruising around the farm. And then, and then also, you know, you'd get to go and they had horses. So the kids would get to go on horse rides and they get, that was awesome. We'd get to go around and help kind of feed the farm animals through that time as well. And I tell you, for me, I mean, all those things were good to take your kids for. But for me, the standout was definitely Auntie Pam's fresh scones. People, if you've had scones from anywhere near Kingaroy, you know you've lived along with the fresh cream, along with the jam. It's amazing. But that was awesome. But I remember one of the trips we had out there years back, right? We were searching through one of the heaps of, you know, old kind of sheds out there. We are looking through one of the old sheds, looking for something. I can't remember what it was with the kids. Anyway, we stumbled upon one of the original, and it was about 20 years old, old school billy carts. Has anyone ever ridden one of the, the original kind of billy carts? Not one you could buy from the shops. I'm talking about the, time that, the kind that's put together on the farm, right, by a bit of old timber that's lying around, finding a little bit of rope, and then normally it's removing the wheels from the old lawnmower, and they're the wheels on the billy cart. You know, that's the type. So we found this. I was like, this is gold. So being a dad, like the thing is like, all right, let's, let's, make, this, let's make this real. Okay, so at the back of Uncle Pete and Auntie Pam's farm is that there is a dirt road. Okay, not one that cars travel on, but there's a dirt road with a really steep incline. It has lots of rocks and it has lots of potholes in it. And so it was a great dad moment to say, okay, let's go. Let's take it to the top of that hill and I'm going to push you down. <laughs> now, probably the greatest feature of these old school billy carts is actually what it doesn't have, which is brakes. So you got to picture this scene. So I would send one of the kids, the oldest, who was Haley. I'd send her down the bottom of the hill. I'm up the top with one of the other two kids, all right, ready to push this. But the first thing we needed to make sure was in place was the camera. Because how many of you know, if you're not filming this thing, it, has, it doesn't count. So she was down the bottom filming this thing. And so I'd stand up the top. And then, uh, so by the way, yeah, Pastor Chris, this would be a great thing to introduce Leo to really soon. He'll love it. Don't tell Beck about it. Just go and find somewhere with a billy cart and go for it. And uh, so anyway, I'd get him at the top. And then I'd start to just run as fast as I possibly could and then just launch them down this hill. Now, you've got to imagine, this is not some kind of like, you know, manicured, nice road. It's filled with holes and rocks and potholes. So that really, there's only two ways you can come to the stop. Either you make it down to the bottom of the hill and then the flat actually slows you down enough to stop, which is a very rare occurrence. Or what happens really is actually that car eventually detours off the gravel. It goes onto the grass and then each of the kids would proceed to somersault about 17 times in order to reach that stop. But I love that because, and we still got the videos. We we play them. It's great laughs, you know, the, around family dinner tables. They pop up. I love watching these videos because as you begin to push them down the hill, what you see is their eyes turn into something resembling saucers. <laughs> like the look of sheer terror in their eyes is just worthy of capture. Usually it was followed by laughter afterwards. Uh, but the, the look of fear 
in their eyes is amazing. And I was thinking about that because there's, there is such thing as, as like healthy fear in our life. So we often talk about fear, right? And we can say, but there is actually a healthy fear. That actually is a healthy fear. That's a healthy fear that usually comes in our life with adrenaline that helps us in dangerous situations and moments to make sure that we are focused and attentive and try our best to keep ourselves from injury or severe harm. That's, that's healthy fear. But how many of you know there's an unhealthy fear as well? It's actually the kind of fear that seeks to control us. It seeks to bring anxiety and turmoil into our lives. And I'm, this, is, this is not news to anyone here, but the last few years across our world, there has been such a ramping up of fear. And I believe it's absolutely vital that as Christians, we understand something, that we have an enemy who wants to use fear so he can gain access to our lives. Why? Because he wants to control our thoughts, manipulate our feelings and ultimately influence our decisions. And the enemy has one agenda and that is to separate us from God and his plans for our life. But the good news, and there is good news, is that fear can be resisted and overcome by faith. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not, let's be emphatic, God has not given to us a spirit or an attitude of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Scripture is crystal clear. God has not given to you a spirit of fear or a spirit that should bring anxiety or doubt or uncertainty into our hearts. What has God given us? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings faith. You see, when God comes, He always brings faith. And it's through faith in God that we receive God's power, we walk in God's love, and we can have a sound mind. We can have healthy thoughts and healthy thinking. And the, the, the greatest gift of faith in God is this, is faith in God will actually help you travel through every trial, every circumstance, and every challenge that you come up against and actually come through it in victory. But we actually have to learn how to use and activate our faith. In the book of Mark chapter 11, Jesus teaches his disciples and in turn us the principles of faith, that actually these principles God wanted his followers to not just understand, but know how to use in their day-to-day -day life. He wanted them to activate and he wants us to activate these principles of faith. And I'm telling you, if you and I understand the principles of faith, and actually learn how to activate them in our life or use them in our day-to-day -day life, you will find they will profoundly change your life and they will profoundly change the lives of people around you as well. In Mark chapter 11, Jesus is talking to his disciples, but he's in a place called Bethany. It's a small town outside of Jerusalem. And what was happening is Jesus and these disciples were traveling back and forth between Bethany and Jerusalem day after day. And we pick it up in Mark 11, verse 11. It says, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went back to Bethany with the 12. The next day, as he was leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went out to find if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then Jesus said to the tree, now can we just pause for a minute? Yes, Jesus is speaking to a tree. Okay, let's, just, let's not just skim past this because I have certain members of my own family who will remain nameless, who are very well known for having deep and lengthy conversations with our golden retriever named Digby. He understands nothing of it. I keep telling him, he understands nothing of these conversations. But here's Jesus. He's sort of going next level. He's speaking to a tree. So we need to ask the question, why is Jesus speaking to a tree? There's a few reasons. We're not going to cover them all, but I'll tell you one reason. The reason Jesus is speaking to this tree is that this tree will become an object lesson to teach his disciples and you and I about faith. Jesus says to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Now we move to verse 20. And I need you to know this, 24 hours have passed. So a whole day's passed now. Verse 20, in the morning now, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered up from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered, and here we go, have faith in God. Truly I tell you, 
If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have already received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Jesus uses the object lesson of this fig tree to teach us the key principles of faith. Are you ready this morning? Here's the first principle. We must have faith in God. Jesus answered four words, which starts us off on the foundation of faith. Have faith in God. So the first thing, the most essential thing we need to know is that our faith has a direction. Our faith is pointed somewhere. Notice Jesus didn't just say, have faith. Like, have you ever heard someone say that? You just, you just got to have faith. Like, that's half right. Like, have faith, yes. But it's have faith in God. Because it's not just putting some, like, divine law into motion. It's about trusting a person. It's about a relationship with the Lord. And how many of you know it's very hard to trust someone that you're not in relationship with? Like, if, if a stranger, right, came, came knocking on my door this afternoon, someone I didn't know, and said, hey, Andrew, or hey, don't even know my name, hey, uh, can I borrow your car for a few hours? Do you know what my response would be? Uh, nope. And very quickly followed by that door closing, really quickly, like, weird. That just doesn't happen, right? And, 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 but it's, but if, if, if Chris came to my house this afternoon and said, Andrew, I just need a car for a few hours. Can I borrow it? I'd be like, I'd grab the keys. I'd just throw it to him straight away. I wouldn't even think about it. Why? Because I have a relationship with Chris. Because I trust him. Because I know that he is faithful and he is reliable and he is trustworthy. And Jesus is teaching us the foundational principle of faith. And it's all about having a relationship with the Lord. In fact, having faith in God literally means I trust him. Having faith in God means I've put my trust in God's character. Like, I know that God is faithful and reliable and trustworthy. And because I have a relationship with Him that's based on trustworthiness of God, then I am secure and strong. You see, having faith in God means I I, I trust in God's character. Having faith in God also means that I believe God's power is greater. So it means that I, I believe that God's power is greater than any lack or any circumstance, or any situation that I'm facing, regardless of the context, regardless of my feelings, regardless of how things look. Sometimes things can be looking completely the opposite of what God is saying. But I believe and I trust that God's power is greater. For example, having faith in God, and let's say there's sickness in my body. Having faith in God literally means I believe God's power is greater than this sickness. Or if there's uncertainty about a decision I need to make in life, what does having faith in God mean? It means that I believe God has the power to give me the wisdom and to open up the path and direct my steps in the way that I should go. Ephesians 1 verse 19 says this, I pray that you would understand how incomparably great God's power is to help those who believe Him. I love it. You know how it says? It says, by faith we understand By faith we see how incomparably great God's power is to who? To those who believe Him. God's God's power is incomparably great, but it's not just out there. It flows towards us as we put our trust in Him because He's the God who wants to help us. And I think the other thing having faith in God means, it means that I trust or I'm confident that God is willing. You see, it's one thing, right, to believe that God is able It's a whole other thing to believe that God is willing. I believe that not only God can, but I believe that God will. You see, the enemy tries to undermine our faith all the time by whispering lies. That God doesn't care for us. That God's not concerned about us. That God will help others, but He won't help us. The enemy's strategy all the time is to undo our faith. How? Simply by getting us to doubt the goodness of God. James 1 verse 16 says this, don't be deceived. Who does deceiving? It's the enemy. He says, don't be deceived, dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, 
Where does it come from? It comes down from the Father of the heavenly lights and He does not change like shifting shadows. What does that mean? It means God is a good, good Father and when we put our faith in Him, we will always see His goodness in our lives. See, faith in God, what Jesus was saying is believing that God is, faith, God is trustworthy, that God is powerful and that God is willing. Here's the second thing Jesus says about the principles of faith is that faith works by saying. Jesus spoke to the tree and it withered up. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Do you know one of the most important ways Jesus is teaching us that we exercise faith in God is actually through the power of our words. Jesus said, I want you to speak to the mountain. I want you to speak to the problem. Do you know what I believe the, the problem that some Christians have? Is that, you know what, they, the, the, the way they exercise their faith, they haven't learned to speak to the problem. They've learned to speak about the problem. So instead of speaking to the mountain, they've, 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 they've turned their focus and they're speaking about the mountain. Like they, they've, they've Googled everything they could find about the mountain. They've looked up their mountain on Wikipedia. They, they have, they've consulted mountain experts. They've even gone to chat GPT and found out a complete essay about the mountain. And what we find is that you, you, it's easy to talk for days about how big and how high the mountain is. But Jesus didn't say speak about the mountain. Jesus says, I want you to speak to the mountain. If anyone says to this mountain, Jesus is telling us, speak to the difficulty. Speak to the lack. Speak to the problem. Speak to the sickness. Speak to the circumstances. Speak to your future. Why? Because He's given us authority. You see, having faith in God, it changes the way that I speak. When we have faith, we begin to declare things. We begin to prophesy things. We begin to speak words of faith over our life, over our circumstances, over our children, over our job, over our future, over the people around us. Faith in God actually empowers us to begin to make words of declaration. And what happens is God anoints those words as we speak them. We see this right back, the first three verses of the Bible in the book of Genesis. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep. Love this bit though. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Can I just pause for a minute? Can I encourage you this morning? The, the Holy Spirit is always hovering. He's always waiting. He's always ready to move. And it says, here it was, and God spoke and said, let there be light, and there was light. And what we see in Genesis verse, uh, chapters 1 to 3, God speaks all of creation into existence. He begins to declare. He begins to speak His Word out. The Holy Spirit anoints that Word at creation. Actually, God demonstrates to us this faith principle in action. What He's showing us is this, is as we speak His Word out, as we speak to and over circumstances, situations, the lives of people around us, things begin to change by God's power. They do. They begin to change. I remember so many times as our kids were growing up, Wendy and I would do this separately and we found out we were doing it separately. We had conversations later as our kids would be going through stuff, you know? And you know, parents, kids go through stuff like health stuff, stuff going on at school, stuff going on in their own lives. And so many times we'd find ourselves and be like, we're walking around the house and we're holding on to like the promise of God. You know, that one of the promises we hold on to is all our children shall be taught by the Lord and great shall be their peace. And we just begin to declare that. We go, I remember going into the kids' rooms and just, just, just declaring that word. Not while they were in the room, because that would be weird. But when they weren't there, because we were taught this, is, this, this principle, this is how faith works. We begin to speak, we begin to declare things. Faith works by saying. Hebrews 11.3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that the things which we are seeing or which are visible to us are not made out of things which are visible. I love how it says the worlds. What does that mean, the worlds? Wouldn't it say just like singular? Well, it means the spiritual world and the natural world. All of it, visible and invisible, was first framed by the Word of God. Can I encourage us today? 
Let God's word frame your world. Don't let negativity frame your world. Don't let fear frame your world. Don't let the voices we hear in the world frame your world. Don't, don't, don't allow those, those words to come from out of our mouth. Like, oh, well, my gosh, you think about something, oh, this will never change. Or we'll never be able to afford to buy our own house. Or this kind of health problem, you know, it just, it just runs in our family. There's nothing we can do about it. Or that's just the way it is. Or, or nothing ever works out for me. Do you know, speaking Scripture is one of the most potent things that we can do with our mouth. When you and I begin to put the Word of God in our mouth, God has not given to me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. My God shall supply all my need according to His riches in glory through Christ Jesus. What happens is we activate God's Word when we speak it. But let me just say this. Here's what's important to understand as well is that speaking words of life, speaking the promises of God, it will have an incredible impact, but it will take time. Do you know when Jesus spoke to that tree, it didn't wither up immediately. There was 24 hours delay between God speaking it and that happening. But here's what you need to understand. It said the tree actually began to wither from the roots. So I want you to see that below the surface, in the unseen realm, Actually, there were things happening. It just was not visible to the human eye. The, 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 the roots of that tree were beginning to wither up. And what we see here is a picture actually of how God works. Is God's power works always first from the spiritual realm and then it makes its way into the natural realm. That's why Jesus said, this is how I want you to pray. Your will be done, God, on earth as it is in heaven. And it's vital, I believe so vital that we do not lose heart. And that's why I love the stories of from Manus today. It's vital we do not lose heart and give up when there's a delay, but we keep speaking and we keep declaring His Word. And here's the final principle. I'd like to get the keys up here this morning. Faith not only works by saying, but faith works by praying. Mark eleven twenty four. it says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, Believe that you have already received it and it will be yours. Now, we need to hear this. This is one of the most important teachings Jesus ever gave us about prayer. Now, this teaching, it literally should be one of the the biggest changes in our mindset when it comes to how we pray. Because Jesus is not saying, hey, pray for something and just hope it happens. This this is not Jesus saying, hey, throw a few prayers up there and just, just see what happens in the future. Now, Jesus said, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have already received it. Jesus saying, I want you to receive something in your heart when you're praying. What Jesus was saying is you can receive by faith what you're praying for before you see it. A little while ago, a couple of months back, uh, we had three kids, uh, our son, Joel, is 17 years old. And uh, I think God's got a sense of humour because I'm like six foot five and I've been looking down on people my whole life. Not, not just, that's physically looking down, by the way, <laughs> not the other way. I don't do that. So, but I'm not, I'm used to like, like looking like this. And so he's now six foot nine. So I'm looking up like this, which he loves. He loves, by the way. Oh gosh. Every time we walk through the kitchen, he loves to pat me on the head. Jeez, it rolls me up. Oh, oh. He just goes, I've got you, Dad. And I'm like, oh, love him. But uh, he's he's big. So one of the challenges of that is is finding shoes. Oh, my gosh. Size 15, people. Size 15. You don't find those in a shop too often, I tell you. So we've resorted to a lot of online shopping, right? A lot of online shopping, especially for shoes. So a little while ago, we were trying to find him a new pair of sports shoes he needed. So I went to, as you do, went to Nike.com, and I put the order in for the shoes. It was awesome. Order them, they had size 15, we were rejoicing. I was like, this is great. And then immediately, as soon as I put that order in, I love online shopping, by the way, it's so good. As soon as I put that order in, like a minute later, the email pops up, there's the receipt, right? There's the proof of purchase. There it is. But even better than getting the receipt, about five minutes later, I love real-time tracking. Like, how good is real-time tracking? (laughs) So I find out that there's this warehouse in Munich, Germany, that had the size 15 and it says it's currently your order is being put together whatever it is in Munich 
So I'm imagining like 15 people in this warehouse in Munich going, we've got the McGrew the shoes, here we go. You know, they're packing it. I'm like, yes, how good, that's in Munich. And then like uh, the next day I get another one. It said, now it's at Berlin. It's at the airport in Berlin. I'm like, yes, we're in Berlin. This is great. Size 15, Nike Air Force, here they come. And then it's in Berlin. And then like the next day I come back and it's in Chang'e Airport. We're in Singapore now, people. I'm like, yes. We're only like an eight hour flight away. This is gold, the shoes are there. And then the next thing it comes across and I get the message, it's in Melbourne. I'm like, yes, we're in the country now. How good, yes, we're there. Then the next day I get the next message along. We're now at Brisbane Airport. I'm like, we're almost in the postcode. This is getting better. And then we get that, I love the message you get like right at the end. It's like your delivery or your, your shoes, your order is ready for delivery today. And then they came and it arrived. And I tell you, you might have seen shoe boxes before. This wasn't like a shoe box. This was like the box when you move house, people. This is what that looked like. On the front doorstep there were the beautiful white Nikes there. He was a blessed young fella to get those. But here's, here's, here's the point. We actually had ownership of those shoes from the very moment we got the receipt. Like they might have been, tra- they might have been in transit somewhere around the world, but they were ours. The receipt that we got was the evidence, it was the proof of our purchase. The shoes might have been in transit, but, but we had them. We had received them. And this is what Jesus is teaching. He's saying, by faith, we receive things and now we're just in a posture where we're waiting to see them. Do you know what God's promises are? God's promises are the receipt. They are the proof of purchase that what you have been praying for, you have already received by faith and now you're just waiting to see them. God's promises are the proof of purchase that you have already received the very thing that God has said that He will give to you. And having faith in God means this simply, you've taken the promise of God as your evidence. And what does that mean? It means, listen, you might say, well, my body is battling with sickness, but yes, but, but thank you, Lord, I have your promise, which says, heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. You might be at the moment, you might be having a family member. It might be a husband, a wife, a a son or daughter. Maybe they've drifted away from God, but you're like, well, yes, Lord, I see that. But you know what? I've got the receipt right here. The Word of God says, all my children shall be taught by the Lord. Great shall be their peace. Maybe you've been believing to buy a house. It's been a challenge for a long time. But you say, God, I've got the proof of purchase. It's right here. It says, and my God shall supply all our need according to His riches in glory, in and through Christ Jesus. This is how faith works. Jesus says faith works by praying because you and I take the promises of God as the proof of purchase in prayer. Hebrews 11 verse one says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence that we have of the things not seen. And here's the thing about that evidence. It's not about how you feel. It's not about how things look. In fact, it's usually exactly the opposite. When you can't see it and when you can't feel it, when everything looks like it's contradictory, faith in God's promises is our evidence. It is our proof. And Jesus said, this is how faith works. Faith works by saying, faith works by praying, faith works by trusting in the God who makes those promises the one who is reliable, the one whose power is greater and the one who not only can, but He promises that He will.